See what love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God. Beloved, we are God's children now. So welcome to this place where God's children love to come for worship, for blessings, for fellowship. Just a reminder, this is the midst of July, so there will not be a fellowship dinner following our service, but look around, those of you who are members here, and invite someone to share a Sabbath meal with you in your home or in the park. Vespers t this evening will be downstairs in the youth room. It's the Bible Trivia Family Fun Night that comes at 7 o'clock this evening. Prayer meeting Wednesday evening, 6.20, here in the sanctuary. Continual continuation of our study of the last chapters in Ministry of Healing. As you see footings for the pergola, uh, between the building and the parking lot, we would just encourage that you remember sanctuary renewal in your personal giving plan. Those of you who live here in Berrien Springs or Berrien County will recall the tragedy at our courthouse this week, having studied the first of two lessons on justice and mercy, social justice, there is a walk tomorrow afternoon. I don't have all the details, but you might want to participate in that as an expression of support for those who experienced loss this last week. We want to encourage you to remember in prayer those who are participating in the Extreme Bible Workout. Hopefully they have weather like we have up at Pictured Rocks, and then those that left this week for uh, the Indian Reservation in Montana. Remember Montana Mission. For those of you with students in Academy, the deadline for Project Assist application is coming a week from Monday, July 25. And a week from tomorrow, that's next Sunday, the 24th, there are two events a work bee at Village Adventist Elementary School from 9 until noon, and that will be followed by our annual church picnic out at Five Pines beginning at 3 o'clock from 3 to 7 at Five Pines. We have a second reading for a nomination, two nominations for individuals to continue serving on the school board for Village Adventist Elementary. That's Conrad Vine and Deborah Bush. Is there a motion that we authorize these two and a second? Seconded. All in favor signify by the uplifted hand. Any opposition? Thank you. These individuals can continue to serve. We have transfer requests that we need to act on. I'll list those who are leaving village there are three that want to join Pioneer Memorial, Carmen Escoto and Park and Shireen Smith. Also leaving are Stephen and Jillian Lutz to the West Covina Hills Church in Southern California. Jillian was one of our seminary pastors. And Stephen and Karen Swenson to the Stevensville Church. Is there a motion that we grant these requests? Okay, and support, all in favor, signify. Thank you. Any opposed? All right, and then we have a number joining us today, and I think you'll see pictures on the screen. Carl Rockwell is joining us from the Jackson, Michigan Adventist Church. Carl lives out at Timber Ridge. He experienced a medical emergency as he was driving this week. Fortunately, he was close to the hospital in Water Valite, and he is in rehab up at Water Valite. So those of you that know Carl, he's the brother of Laviva Slayton. Okay, next we have Jerry and Dulcie Hulick coming from PMC. Next, Veronica Johnson with her sons Christopher and Eric 
from PMC. Here are Arlen and Diane Springer returning to Village from PMC. Randy and Kathy Borchert coming from PMC. And here's our harpist, Christina Guzzi, joining us from the Brandon Adventist Church down in Florida. And Deanna Her Hippler coming from Thousand Oaks, California, and her husband Jim from Stevensville. Is there a motion that we grant these requests? Thank you and support all in favor signify by the uplifted hand. Welcome to the Village Church family. May your fellowship be enriched and may you enrich ours as we move forward from Sabbath to Sabbath. We're privileged to welcome to our pulpit today Professor of New Testament from the seminary, who also serves as the first elder up at the Eau Claire Church, Dr. Tom Shepard. While I served at Adventist Frontier Missions, he came and did a week of prayer at AFM, and it was an enriching experience. I know we're going to be blessed by his message. Let's join together in singing our opening hymn, Thank you for coming to lead us. Let's stand together.
take your seats, turn around and greet somebody in Jesus' name, whether with a holy smile, a holy hug, or however, but make sure that everybody in this place encounters somebody. We're living in desperate times, but we know that there's nothing that can fill the desperation, the void, the emptiness, except Christ. And so today as we worship, I pray that you will allow him to be your all in all. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. would be taken from number 221 Rejoice the Lord is King and it says from Philippians 4 verse 4 Rejoice in the Lord always again I will say rejoice
you've been following the news lately, but there's a whole lot of turmoil everywhere. When Jesus said that these are the beginning of birth pangs, I think he was talking about some time ago. But we have long gone beyond the beginning of birth pangs. The contractions are really intense, and the time between one and the next is very short. Between Texas and Paris and in the Middle East, it is happening everywhere. And St. Joe, minutes before we were in St. Joe for a visit from the university, we may say we're in a little safe haven right here. This doesn't bother me. This doesn't affect me. But think again. It doesn't take much for our world to be turned upside down. But this is not to make us panic because we know that in the presence of Almighty God, we can find rest for our souls. Today, as we listen to the scriptures and as we sing, may your soul be still, not in apathy, but in contentment that our God is able to keep us. It's found in Psalms 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, we find an amazing promise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord.
Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Let's open God's word. We'll be reading this morning from Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. Giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In the kingdom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the dead of the bo- he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything we might he might have supremacy. For God has pleased I'm sorry, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Good morning. What a beautiful day. I struggle with what's going on around the world myself. Uh, It's just everywhere. Everybody's running from something. And uh, total strangers are getting run down by trucks. People are being shot in courtrooms. People are dying, drowning on a day off. Camp counselors are losing their lives. Yes, those, those pains are close. Way too close. And we have a fair number in seats here today, but this house isn't packed. Where is everybody? Montana trip, okay, we'll give it that. That time is close. I ask everybody that to please kneel with me as we pray that God will be walking with us. Our Father in heaven, the ruler of all things, including death, please draw close to us now. Be with the many families that have been affected by tragedy just in the last few hours. Help them to see that we need you. Draw close to us in all that we're doing, talking about, participating in. Be with our missions. Help them to be the testimony they need to be for those in a lost world. Help them to reflect your character in all that they do and say, even when it's not fun. Father, as you be with those youth ministries, those camps, 
around this country and around the world. And bless those that have seen tragedy even this week. Bless the kids that are counselors and bless the directors. And bless those conferences. Father, I ask that you be with the many families affected in East France and the craziness of it. Bring peace to hearts and help them to see that they need, they need you. Father, be with those families affected by our court disaster this week. And by the many families that participated in the viewings and the discussions and the many political things attached to this, Father, I ask that you just bring peace to those families. And Father, around this country as as People are being shot. People are being falsely accused. People that should be. Father, you know. I ask that justice be done. And we know that you are the final judge. Father, I ask that you bless this church. Bless our speaker this morning as he talks about you as being ruler over all things, including death. Bless our, our dreams for this church. Bless our school as it's going to begin soon. Bless the academy and the college, university. Bless our many departments within our conferences, but Father, please bless us as we choose the path that is true. Help our leadership to make choices when it is sometimes difficult. Help us to stay on the path that leads to you. Please forgive us as a church for our sins. Help us to come humbly to you for the search of truth in all things. Draw us closer to you today on your day. Set aside for us. Help us to be a stronger community and help us to reach out to those just even here in love. These things I ask in your name, amen. Good morning, church family. Ellen White reminds us in uh, her book, Patriarchs and Prophets, the system of tithes and offerings was intended to impress the minds of men with a great truth that God is the source of every blessing to his creatures and that to him man's gratitude is due for the good gifts of his providence. And I follow that up with Solomon's writing, writings here in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 26, God's plea for us, O oh my son, give me your heart. May your eyes take delight in following my ways. And that's really what God wants. That's the attitude that he wants from us when we give our tithes and offerings. He just wants our hearts to be following him and his character. And while I'm up here, um, I've had the privilege, many of you know, of uh, teaching at our local church school, the village school, for the last 15 years, and I would be remiss right now if I didn't take that opportunity just to thank you as the Village Church for your time, your energy, your offerings, and your gifts that you have provided for that school to keep that school as a 
a great training ground uh, for our young people. And I think I speak for my colleagues as well when we sincerely uh, thank you for that and your efforts uh, for that as well. Uh, today's offerings uh, will go to our uh, local combined budget, and I ask you to bow your heads for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, for the freedom that we have uh, to gather in your house of worship this morning, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful Sabbath day uh, that you've given us. Uh, many things uh, going on in our world today, Lord, that we know about in France, Turkey, even right here earlier this week in our local Berrien County. And Lord, we know that these are signs of uh, your second coming. As, as the old hymn says, nations are angry, men run to and fro. Jesus is coming again, Lord. And it is that promise uh, that we hold on to uh, this morning. And we just ask your blessings on the tithes and offerings that uh, we are about to give back to you and pray that you will bless them to hasten your very soon second coming. In your name we pray. Amen. May the deacons please come forward. Well, now it's time for the children's story. So we want to invite all the children to come up front. I think they collect an offering as they come for helping some wonderful cause, I'm sure. What does the children's offering help? It's mainly for the Sabbath schools. Um, repair, repaint, refit. There's a little clip here I didn't need to do. Would you give that back to Bruce? It's in my pocket. That's part of the... Okay. The, sure. Thing. Sure.
Okay. All right. Everybody's coming up here. Everybody's coming up here. Amen. Here they come. Oh, and they've got those dollars in their hands. Amen. All right. Put those in the basket. All right. Come sit down on the steps. Come sit down on the steps, everybody. Okay. <clears throat> this story comes from a long, long time ago. And it's a story that Jesus told. There was going to be a party. How many of you like to go to a party? Oh, yes, parties are so much fun. Even, even these people like to go to parties. <laughs> and this party was a very special party. It was a wedding party. And there were 10 young ladies who were invited to the wedding party. Well, five of them were wise, but five of them were foolish. And one of the foolish ones went home and she said, Oh, mother, I've been invited to a party. Please help me find the right clothes to wear, will you? And they went into the room and they got some clothes out. And she looked at them and she said, Mother, which one do you think looks better, this one or this one? And her mother said, Oh, I think it's the second one. Oh, she said, I did too. This is the one that came from Tyre and Sidon. It's so soft and nice. Just feel it. It feels so soft and nice. Oh, yes, that'll be just perfect. And then another one went home, one of the foolish ones, and she said, Oh, mother, mother, I've been invited to a wedding party. She said, and can I wear some of that nice, beautiful perfume that comes from Alexandria? The one that smells so good, you know? And she said, Oh, well, it's very expensive, you know. Well, yes, but can, it's a special party, couldn't it? Please, please, please. Oh, I suppose so. We'll let you put some on so people can smell the nice smell. And another one of the foolish girls went home and she said, Oh, mother, we've been invited to a special wedding party. She said, Can I wear those special bracelets, the beautiful bracelets from Babylon? And her mother said, Oh, those are expensive. Yes, but they're so beautiful. Can't I wear them? Then everybody can see what I look like. She said, well, I think that'll probably be all right. And another one of the girls, one of the wise girls went home. And she said, oh, mother, please help me. I'm looking for something. I'm looking for something. Please help me. Do you suppose she was looking for the beautiful clothes that came from Tyre and Sidon? No. And she kept looking. Oh, mother, please help me find what I'm looking for. I'm still looking. Do you suppose that she was looking for the beautiful smelling perfume that came from Alexandria? No. And she said, please help me find. I'm trying to find what I'm looking for. Do you suppose that she was looking for the beautiful bracelets from Babylon? No. She kept looking and looking and looking. And oh, here it is. And she found a little empty bottle. An empty bottle? She said, yes, mother, please put some of your olive oil in here so I'll have some extra oil for my lamp. And I'll put a little cork in it because you never know when the bridegroom might come. He could come late at night. Well, that's very wise, said mother. Well, the night came for the party, and it was very special. Now, in Jesus' day, what they did with these parties is everybody gathered at the, at the bride's house, and the virgins, these young ladies with their lamps, would all be waiting, and when the bridegroom came to pick up the, the, the bride, they would all walk together over to the bridegroom's house, and then they would have a wonderful party and wonderful food. And so they were really excited, and they had all their lamps, and they were waiting. But you know, sometimes weddings go a little, take a little time, and they get a little late. Well, they were waiting and waiting and talking, and the one girl said, Oh, look at my beautiful clothes. They're so soft. Feel them. They come from Tyre inside, and they're so nice. And the other one said, Oh, smell my beautiful perfume that comes from Alexandria. It's so nice. And the other girl said, Oh, look at my beautiful bracelets from Babylon. And they all said, Wow, those are really special. And they were all waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, and the bridegroom didn't come. And you know, if you stand up for a long time, after a while, your feet get tired. And they said, oh, I, I once said, I, I, my feet are tired. I'm just going to sit down. And everybody thought that was a good idea, so they all sat down. And they were sitting and talking and sitting and talking and waiting. And it got later and later. And after a little bit, somebody oh, started to yawn. And you know, when once somebody starts to yawn, everybody starts yawning. And pretty soon she's sitting back and she said, I'm just going to set my lamp here and I'm just going to rest my eyes just a little bit. And everybody thought that was a good idea. And pretty soon, all of them were asleep. Well, it was almost midnight 
when suddenly there was a cry, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And all of the girls got up and they picked up their lamps and they held them up and their lamps were going out. They had waited so long. Well, the wise girls reached into their pockets and they took out the little bit of oil and they poured it into their lamp and the lamp started to burn up bright again. But the foolish girls didn't have any oil. And they said, oh, our lamps are going out. Please help us, give us some of your oil. And the girl said, I'm, I'm sorry, I already poured all my oil into my lamp. Oh, but if you go down, you can maybe buy some, before it's all over, you can get some, go down to the store and buy some. Well, it was late at night, but the five foolish girls had nothing else to do. So they ran off to the store, they ran down to the street, and they were running and running, they came to the house of somebody selling, and they knocked on the door. And they waited. Oh, it was the middle of the night. They knocked again. Who's there? Who's there? From inside the house. Oh, come and help, help, help. We need to buy some oil. Why oil at this time of the night? And the man opened the door. He looked very old and very tired. And he said, well, what do you want at this time of the night? And they said, oh, we need some oil for the wedding party. We need some oil. Please sell some oil. All right, all right. Be patient. I'll get some oil. And he went to get the oil. But while the foolish girls were off buying the oil, the bridegroom came. And the five wise girls held up their lamps and they got to walk at the front of the procession to the bridegroom's house and they went inside and oh, it was such a beautiful party with such wonderful food. And they were all sitting there and the foolish girls finally got their oil and they came running down the street and they said, wait for us, wait for us. And they came to the door of the house but the door was already shut. And they knocked on the door. And they could hear the music and the party inside. And they could smell the nice food. Oh, please let us in, let us in. They knocked on the door. Finally, somebody came to the door and opened the door. And it was the bridegroom himself. And he looked out the door. And the girls all held up their lamps. Oh, we're here for the wedding party too. And he looked and he, their lights were in their faces. He couldn't see them. He said, I'm sorry, I don't know you. And he shut the door. <gasps> Oh, they said, then no, nobody's going to see my nice clothes from Tyre and Sidon, and nobody's going to smell my beautiful perfume from Alexandria, and nobody will see my beautiful bracelets from Babylon. Oh, no, it was so sad outside, but inside, they were at the party having such a wonderful, wonderful time. And they were eating the food and they sat down and, and one of the wise girls turned to her companion. She said, oh, I'm so glad that I brought extra oil with me because you never know when the bridegroom will come. And that's the end of the story. Now you can go back and sit down with your parents. Thank you for being such good listeners.
Could I speak more reverently? If I could see, see the Savior standing nigh, watching Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to be here at the Village Church with you today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word, to consider the meaning that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, I used to teach at Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska, and my major area of instruction is New Testament, but my cognate area when I did my PhD here at Andrews was in ethics, and Miroslav Kish was actually my professor. And so when they had ethics classes, I was the natural person to teach those classes. Well, one of the classes that I taught was a class in medical ethics for students who were in the physician assistant program at uh, Union College. Now, a number of these students were of Adventist background, but a good number were, uh, came from 
other denominations or sometimes maybe even no denomination, but mostly they were Christians because they wanted to come to a Christian school to study uh, their physician assistant program. So in the medical ethics class, one of the things I felt that they should, I had them read the book Ministry of Healing, and uh, one of the things I thought that they, they ought to know is the biblical basis of the principles of health. So I had a whole lecture that went through this and talked about the different biblical principles that underlie what we normally call the Adventist health message. Well, part of that is the uh, biblical anthropology that you do not have a soul, you are a soul. Now, if you remember the uh, teaching that we have, if you go back to Genesis and you read that God took the dust of the earth and made the man and he breathed into him its nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So I taught them you don't have a soul, but you are a soul. Then I went on to explain the, one of the implications of that is that the dead are sleeping in the grave. Now, if you have heard that all through your life, that's no big surprise that the Bible teaches this. But if that's not something that you know, you're used to, it can be quite a shock. I had quite a reaction one time as I taught this, that uh, there was one student who uh, recently her grandmother had died, and she believed that her grandmother was in heaven watching over her. And to hear that her grandmother was not in heaven, that she was asleep in the grave, in the cold grave, was just too much. And I, there was a, she had a very sharp, strong, negative reaction to what I had to say. I learned a lesson that day that you must prepare people when you introduce something to them that is shocking and new. You must be gentle and not go too far. Well, today our topic is the intersection between two doctrines that the Adventist Church teaches, the state of the dead and the second coming of Jesus. These two great doctrines are central to our beliefs as Seventh-day Adventists, and the text we're going to study today has an intersection of these two ideas of the state of the dead and the second coming of Jesus, and we're going to contemplate today that intersection. Let's start with a review of the beautiful doctrine of the state of the dead. First, Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 and 6 teach us, the dead know not anything. Over in Psalm 115, verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord. Now, if they were in heaven, you would expect them to be praising God. That's what happens in heaven. When you die, Psalm 146, verse 4 says, your thoughts perish that very day. The dust returns to the earth, and the spirit or breath returns to God who gave it, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Now, I want to focus your attention on this word, returns. And since I want to be fair, I'll point to both screens. <laughs> All right? So maybe you have sometimes when they only point to one screen and you're on the other side of the church and like, that's not fair. <laughs> they, they need to be pointing to both screens, right? Okay. So the word returns. How many of you, how many of you can return to Brazil? Well, I see a few hands. There's a few of us who could return to Brazil. All right? How many of you would like to go to Brazil sometime? Uh, there's a lot more hands. Now, what's the difference between those who would like to go and those who can return? Been there before, all right? Been there before. If you've already been there before, you can return someplace. If you haven't been there, you can't return. Now, notice what the text says, that the dust returns to the earth and the spirit or breath returns to God. Somebody says, oh, wait a minute, Pastor. Wait a minute. That word spirit Maybe that's the soul, and maybe that's, you know, sentient and thinking, and, and they can go up to heaven. Well, remember, it says return, and the dust returns. The text that this is alluding to is Genesis 2, verse 7, that God made the man out of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It doesn't say the breath went into him, the soul went into him, all right? So, it's very clear that this, this spirit, whoop, this spirit, let's go back there. All right, it's easy to mess up these things. All right, the spirit, there's the pointer. The spirit is the breath that returns to God. It's not sentient 
It wasn't sentient before God gave it. It's the principle of life that God breathed into people. You see, it's very much like a box. If a carpenter takes wood and nails and puts them together, he gets a box. Now, what if he takes the box apart and lays the boards and the nails separately? What happened to the box? Where did it go? Well, the box doesn't exist without being together as boards and nails. So when you take them apart, the box no longer exists. All right? This is the same thing. The, we are a souls. We don't have souls. And so when it returns to God, then the person is no longer there. You say, that's very encouraging, Tom. Uh, thank you for sharing that, that when I die, that's the end of me. Well, it may not be the end of you because now we will review that other great doctrine, which is the second coming of Jesus. The Bible teaches that the second coming of Jesus will be literal, it will be visible, it will be audible, it will be worldwide, and he is coming soon. Amen? Amen? Now, if you notice, I don't know if you can read that. This, this is all, these are Nathan Green's pictures. I just this week got from my friend Nathan Green a, uh, there's a little uh, jump drive with all of his pictures that you can use for PowerPoints. You're not supposed to print them out. Thank you very much. All right. But, uh, um, you know, pictures for putting the screens uh, on, in, in PowerPoints and in uh, sermon slides. And I went a little crazy this morning, so there's a lot of slides from Nathan Green's pictures. He's a great guy, good friend, and, uh, you know, just uh, nearby. So, uh, anyways, it's, it's going to be. Now, let's look at some of the Bible texts that teaches about this, a review of the second coming. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. There is a day coming, my friends, when those who have died in Christ will rise again. They will come back to life to be with the Lord forever. Over in John chapter 14, Jesus said these words, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe, uh, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, notice these words here in bold, I will come again. Actually, in Greek, in English, it's a future tense, but in Greek, it's a present tense. I am coming again. And you say, well, then, 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 then why do they translate it as a future tense? Well, believe it or not, there's a use of the future tense in Greek that's called, are you ready for it? The futuristic present. This is the present tense. A futuristic present. You say, wow, what's that mean? A futuristic present is used when you talk about a future event as so certain that you describe it as though it's already happening. All right? So, it is actually fine for us to translate these words, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will most certainly come again and take you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Don't you love Greek? It's just so much fun to learn that stuff. That's the futuristic present. You see, you want to remember that. Now, our text for today is... Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Open your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 1. It's one of those little books in the New Testament that likes to hide when you're looking for it. All right? Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Just after Philippians, just before 1 Thessalonians. Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 15 to 20. All right? Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and him and all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether earth, on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Did you get the word that always comes in that, sin, in, in, in that passage? All, all, all. It was all there, always all. My, 
What is he trying to say? We ask the question, you see, what does firstborn of the dead mean? What does this term mean? All right, so we have to understand this term. I don't know if this is losing its mojo. I guess I got a point up there. Understanding the term firstborn. Now, the Greek term, you got to learn a few Greek words, right, is prototokos. I like the way that sounds. Doesn't that sound cool? Prototokos. All right. This became an important word in early church uh, discussions about Jesus and his, and his nature. It comes from two words, protos, which means first, foremost, or primary, and tokos, which means childbirth or offspring. It comes from the Greek verb tikto, which means to give birth. Thus, we get the idea of firstborn. You say, well, wow, that makes it sound like Jesus was somebody, was created or something. Is that what this is teaching? Well, hang on, we're not done yet right? The firstborn concept, this idea of the firstborn, is an Old Testament idea, all right? The firstborn in the Old Testament tradition, the, the person who was firstborn, typically the firstborn son, became the spiritual head of the family. He received a double portion of the inheritance. Somebody says, what is this double portion stuff? I've always been trying to figure out what this double portion means. All right, if a man had three sons, when he died and they were going to come and split up his inheritance, they would take the number of sons and divide it by that number plus one, okay? And then the firstborn son would get two portions, and then the others would get one portion. So if there were three sons, how much would the firstborn son get? Half. Half. Boy, this is wonderful math, you know? Want to be that firstborn? Well, don't, don't be so sure quite so fast, okay? Okay. Um, the person, the firstborn, holds a position of primacy. Now, it's very interesting in the Old Testament that the firstborn may not be the firstborn child. You say, what? Yeah, the firstborn child doesn't always turn out to be that primary person, that person of preeminence, that person who leads the family. In fact, it's, it seems to be a trend throughout the Old Testament that this is what happens. You know, uh, Adam and Eve, their first children, what, what was their names? Cain and Abel. And which one was first born? Cain. And how did it turn out for him? Not so good. Okay, we go down a little bit later. If we come to Abraham, he has two, two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Who was the first born? Ishmael. How did it turn out for him? Not so good. All right, we go down to Isaac. He has two sons, Esau and Jacob. Who was the first born? Esau, how did it turn out for him? Not so good. Okay, you kind of get the picture, you know, and it just keeps going on. It happens with Moses, you know. And then finally you come down to David. Was he the firstborn son of Jesse? No, he was the, he was the last one. He was the, he was the runt, the puppy, you know. He was the, he was the, they, they didn't even call him when Samuel was, uh, was, was calling for the people. He was out taking care of the sheep. You know, it's like you think about if the president were to die in office or something and they, the vice president becomes, you know, and then they have this whole, I don't know if you realize, they have a whole line of people that they have listed out, you know, and like the secretary of agriculture is like number 15 or something like that, you know, you say like, not too likely that the secretary of agriculture is going to become the president, you know. Well, here, turn over to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, and we're going to look at Psalm, which is an individual Psalm, Psalm 89. Psalm 89, verse 20 to 29. Boy, this is, quite a, this is quite a text. Psalm 89, starting in verse 20. And this is all about David. David. Now notice what it says here. Listen carefully. Psalm 89, starting in verse 20, going through verse 29. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him, so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. You notice how him is coming up a lot? I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness, my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation, and I will make him the firstborn the highest of the kings of the earth. 
My steadfast love I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. My, what a picture. So we see here that the firstborn can also mean most prominent or preeminent. It doesn't necessarily mean the firstborn child. David was the lastborn child of Jesse, but he becomes the firstborn, the preeminent one. So we ask, what does the firstborn mean in Colossians 1? All right. It's used twice. In verse 15, Christ is called the firstborn of creation, firstborn of all creation, actually. And in verse 18, Christ is the firstborn of the dead. Now, what do these terms mean? Well, they were misunderstood. There was a, a man, there he is, there's a picture of him by the name of Arius. He was a Christian priest in Alexandria in the 300s AD, and he taught that Christ was created. He used Colossians 1.15, our very verse, to argue that Jesus is not divine but created. This is termed Arianism, and the people today who are the examples of Arianism are our friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses, who teach that Jesus is not divine, that he was created. Now somebody says, how do you know whether or not this means that Jesus was created or not? All right, this is not, Arius' teaching is not what Colossians 1 actually teaches. Colossians 1 teaches that Jesus has the preeminent position. Well, you say that's a nice statement, Dr. Shepard, but, you know, how do you know? Well, because in verse 16, it says he created all things. Now, all is all, right? I mean, he created all things. And you say, well, maybe there was something left out? No, it's followed by a series of merisms. Oh, you say, oh, that's great. What is a merism? Well, a merism is to speak of the totality by expressing it from the furthest extent to the furthest extent. If you said, from sea to shining sea, all right, from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean, you're talking about the United States of America, the whole country, all right, from sea to shining sea. If you said heaven and earth, you're talking about all of creation. In fact, in the Sabbath commandment, things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, God created everything. He's the creator of all, all right? If you, and, and if you look at our church text, if you turn over to Colossians, Colossians 1, and you'll see these words. Colossians 1, verse 15 said, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. That's a merism. Visible and invisible. That's a merism. See? Whether it's thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. It says by him, through him, for him. The book of Colossians is focused, is focused on the preeminence of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because the heresy that the Apostle Paul is fighting here was a heresy that you might say it, it was probably, it's a little hard to figure out exactly what it was, but it's probably syncretic. It was probably putting together different things from different religions. You can say it this way. It's like you can never have too much fire insurance. Right? You can never have too much fire insurance. If you don't want to end up in hell, you better make sure that you bow down to every God there is because you don't know for sure which one is the right one. And if you show, if you show honor to each of them, then you're sure to get in. Everything will be just fine. You can never have too much fire insurance. Well, the point that the Apostle Paul makes in the book of Colossians is what we might call Bible math. Are you with me? Bible math. And here's the Bible math. If you add on to Jesus, you subtract from him. If you add on to Jesus, you subtract from him. Now, that's not original with Tom Shepard, one of my teachers. Kevin, but, you know, you can always borrow from your teachers, right? Amen. Amen. If you add on to Jesus, you subtract from him. So Paul is, goes out of his way to put Jesus at the top to show how important, how preeminent 
Jesus is. That's the wonderful teaching of Colossians chapter 1. You say, all right, I get the firstborn of all creation. But what about, what about verse 18? What does this firstborn of the dead mean? What is he talking about when he talks about that? All right. So, Jesus as the firstborn of the dead. Jesus was not the first person raised from the dead. And we think of Moses. We think of Lazarus. We think of several other people that Jesus raised from the dead before his own resurrection. So, firstborn didn't mean like first person raised, right? But Jesus' resurrection is unique. Unique because of who he is. He's not the first one raised, but he's the most important person raised from the dead. God set his seal on the mission of Jesus by raising him from the dead. He put his seal on his sacrifice, the forgiveness of our sins and redemption and the hope that you and I can be raised from the dead. Jesus' resurrection assures our resurrection. But someone says, all right, I see that, Pastor, but here I have another question. How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? What is the evidence? All right. Now, it's, there's nothing wrong with asking this question. All right. First, I want to say that. Uh, when young people ask a question like this, or if they ask us, does God exist? We should come with some good answers. We should, we should have some evidence to present to them, to help them. Ellen White put, makes this kind of statement in the book Steps of Christ that we always have to believe. There's room for doubt always, but that God gives us evidence upon which to base our faith. And the evidence appeals to our reason. So the question is, what is the evidence about the, the resurrection of Jesus? How do you know Jesus rose from the dead? The friends and the enemies of Jesus agreed that the tomb was empty on Sunday morning. It confounded both his friends and his enemies that he would have raised from the dead. His, his friends, at first, didn't really believe it. They, uh, many of them were, were unconvinced when women came and said that they had heard a message or had even seen Jesus himself, and they didn't believe it. So most people started off not believing that Jesus rose from the dead. But the tomb was empty. That's a very important issue. Remember that biblical anthropology. All they had to do was show the body to say that Jesus had not risen. All right? So it's, it's very interesting. Well, somebody says, how do you know that grave robbers didn't take the body? Hmm. Maybe they broke into the tomb and just took the body of Jesus. Well, what are grave robbers looking for? Grave robbers are looking for valuables not a dead body, and they don't fold face cloths. You say, wait, wait, could you explain that a little bit? All right. Grave robbers are interested in money. So if there's jewels or there's something valuable in the tomb, that's what they go after. When they go after it, they go after it quickly. They don't take their time to fold grave cloths. They don't take the body. The body is not of interest to them. What they want is the money. You say, well, was there anything valuable in Jesus' tomb? Well, yes, there was. Now, Jesus was a poor man, but remember, he was buried in a rich man's tomb. And the rich man, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, brought like a hundred pounds of very expensive spices. And so that would be worth a lot of money. That's what the grave robbers would be after, not the body of Jesus. So this explanation of the grave robbers taking the body isn't very good, you see, because they would take the valuables quickly, they would run away, but when John and Peter came to the tomb, it tells us in the Gospel of John chapter 20, that they found that the face cloth that had been over Jesus' face was folded and put by itself. And the, the text says that John saw it and believed. He said, believed what? Believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Because, again, Grave robbers wouldn't do that. And so what really happened, John saw, he, he, he sensed that what had happened was when Jesus arose from the dead, he took that face cloth and he folded it and he put it there and he said, that's for John. <laughs> well, John is the one who saw it and wrote about it and Peter, Peter saw it as well. 
Now, if that's not a good explanation, well, how do you know the disciples didn't steal the body? Now, the disciples could arguably have been said to have an interest in a risen Jesus. So, how do we know that they didn't go in and steal the body? Well, the tomb was sealed and guarded. It was sealed and guarded by the enemies of Jesus. All right? Now, if you were the enemies of Jesus and you wanted to make sure they remembered that he had said he would rise from the dead and you wanted to be sure that he didn't do that, how many guards, how many soldiers would you put outside the tomb? Two? Three? Well, I'll tell you, if it was in my control, I would probably put 20 or 30, you know? We, we'd really have a big contingent of guards out there, you know, guarding the tomb. Because remember, Jesus had 12 disciples. Now it's only 11. Judas is already dead, but there's other friends of Jesus. They could come. It could be trouble, you know? So... You want to have a good, so there's probably quite a few guards at the tomb. You say, well, couldn't the disciples have come and stolen the body while the guards were asleep? This is the story that got circulated. Well, let's think about that for a moment. They have to come, all the guards are sleeping, all 20 or 30 of them, all right? The disciples have to sneak up quietly. They have to break the seal roll back the big stone quietly, go inside, get the body of Jesus. Now, see, one guy can't do this. You got to have like four, five, six, maybe all 11 of them, you know, and, they, and they, every one of them has got to be quiet. They got to go in there. They got to take the body of Jesus. Oh, don't forget, it's a face, fold up the face cloth, put it over here, okay, and sneak off without one of the guards waking up. Please. That just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't hold water. And in fact, if they had done that, how in the world would the guards know that they had taken the body if they were sleeping? So this explanation, this explanation is neither reasonable nor convincing. When you're asleep, you don't know what's going on, and the entire cohort of God's being asleep when their lives depended on it is really not a sensible answer. So, what is the answer? Here's the explanations that don't work. First of all, grave robbers. Sorry, doesn't cut it. Second of all, guards asleep. Sorry, doesn't cut it. Third, disciples stole the body. Sorry, doesn't really cut it. Well, what's left? Here's an explanation from famous scholar N.T. Wright. Here's what he said in his book, the resurrection of the Son of God. We are left with the conclusion that the combination of empty tomb and appearances of the living Jesus forms a set of circumstances which is itself both necessary and sufficient for the rise of early Christian belief. Without these phenomena, we cannot explain why this belief came into existence and took the shape it did. With them, we can explain it exactly and precisely. So what is the answer to this question? Let me tell you. The best explanation is that Jesus rose from the dead. It best explains the evidence of the empty tomb. It best explains the rise of the early Christian church. It best explains how Peter could become a leader of the early Christian church. You say, how is that? Well, remember, Peter had denied Jesus. And if he came to the rest of the disciples and said, Oh, Jesus, Jesus appeared to me in a vision. He said I was forgiven. You're going to let him be one of the leaders of the church. Right. Right. I don't think so. No. No, you say, uh, Peter, you know, just go and be a fisherman again, okay? You messed up, you know, you can't do this. No, but he became one of the early leaders. The evidence points to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So, Let's go on to the next point, which is Jesus is, we've said, the firstborn, but he's the firstborn of the dead. Now, what in the world does this of the dead mean? He said, I've been waiting for that all this sermon. Would you please explain? Okay. Let's see if I can point this thing the right direction. It'll, it'll, okay, now the word of can mean many different things, right? You can say it can... It can be ownership, like the car of John. 
That would be John's car, right? can refer to ownership. It can refer to source. Jesus of Nazareth. He comes from Nazareth. It can also, surprisingly, mean separation. There's a beautiful text over in the book of uh, 1 John. It says, they went out from us, but they weren't from us. All right. So the first one, they went out from us, is the separation, but they weren't from us. That's source, okay? One text that has these two different ideas. And it can also mean subordination. We say the captain of the army. He's captain over the army. Now, a very good case can be made that uh, subordination is what's being talked about here. He's the firstborn over the dead. He's like in charge of the dead, you know, subordination. But we can also, I want to I preach to you today the good news of what in, the, in, in Greek we call the genitive case. I want to talk to you about the genitive of source, all right? Jesus as the firstborn from the dead, you know, from among the dead, instead of being separated from the dead, it's the firstborn of the dead. You say, I don't quite get it. What does that term mean? How do we make sense of this? All right, so let's keep going. The second coming in the dead. We need to look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18 to understand this well. That's the very next book after Colossians. Isn't that convenient? You know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. Open your Bibles there. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. All right, now, let's think about this passage. I want to think with you about the second coming of Jesus. Boy, that is a wonderful, wonderful topic, especially as we think about those who have died and who are raised back to life when Jesus returns. Now, let's think about the dead and Jesus Notice that there is a relationship of the dead to Jesus in this passage. There's a connection between them. I want you to notice this. What are we saying? In verse 14, it says, with him. Look at verse 14 again. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now, when does that happen? When will that take place? Notice that in the verse, there's a beautiful kind of a um, structure that helps us understand. It says, for since we believe that Jesus died, Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. All right? Now, to give you a little picture of this, it's what we call a chiastic structure, A, B, B, A structure. And the structure goes like this. Jesus died and rose. Now, to go back over here. God will bring those who sleep. Notice the A's are about people who are dead, and the B's is about resurrection. So when will he bring them? He'll bring them when he brings them after he comes back to pick, to pick us up, to take us home. And that bringing with him involves the dead and it involves us. And the whole rest of the passage is all about that. So the meaning here is not that they go with him when they die or something like that, because this passage is all about the resurrection. Notice this wonderful relationship also in verse 14. We have the words through Jesus, with Jesus and through Jesus. Now, the dead Christians sleep through Jesus. It's very interesting that the, uh, the, the text in Greek, the last part of this verse, now if, if you read the last part of the verse in, um, in English, you probably won't get it because it says, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. 
But the order in Greek is a little different and says, it goes like this, and God, those who sleep through Jesus, he will bring with him. So the through Jesus can go either with the sleeping or with the bringing. But I maintain actually it goes with the sleeping because he's already got the with him. He's already got the with him to talk about the resurrection. That's what I'm suggesting is that this through him is connected with people when they're dead. Somebody says, I don't quite get that. He is the means, you see, the agent by whom they sleep. I'm afraid we Adventists have made the state of the dead far too cold and dark. Far too cold and dark. I want you to realize that it is warmed up with the Lord Jesus. Now, it's not that the dead are, are conscious. They are not conscious. They're asleep, okay? But let's notice again. It says in verse 16 that the dead in Christ will rise. The dead in Christ. The in Christ phraseology here is something that is common in the Apostle Paul when he talks about what it means to be a Christian. Paul describes the church as the body of Christ and Christians as his limbs. Metaphorically, to describe the Christian experience, he says that we are in Christ. Take your concordance or your phone or whatever and look up the phrase in Christ and see how many times the Apostle Paul uses that terminology. Well, I'm bringing you good news today that if you're a Christian and you die, you are still in Christ. You are still in Christ. You say, I don't get that. How does that work? Well, it's kind of like this. It's like a baby asleep in its mother's arms, waiting till the mother wakes the baby up. The dead in Christ are not separate from Christ. You see, Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He was dead, and he is alive forevermore. But he has a link to those people who die. If you haven't died yet, I don't think any of us have died here yet. If you haven't died yet, Jesus has got something you don't have. But all of our friends who have died, they have that in common with Jesus. So in a sense, they have more in common than Jesus with Jesus than you and I do. Because they are now sleeping in the grave, awaiting his return. It is good news. Now notice, through Jesus, asleep through Jesus, God will bring them with Jesus. They are the dead in Christ. Our dead are not separated from the Lord, even though they are dead. They are not conscious now but he is conscious of them and where they rest. The day is coming soon when he will raise them back to life. The great harvest is near. I want to be ready for that day, don't you? Let us pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this good news that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead and that those of our friends who have fallen asleep in Christ are still in Christ asleep in his arms, awaiting the resurrection day. Oh, Father, prepare us for that great day. Help us to ever remain faithful to you and to rejoice in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sing with me the glorious hymn, closing hymn, which is hymn number 166, Christ the Lord is risen today. Mark the words of this hymn. They are glorious. Thank you.
pray. Dear Father in heaven, bless your people, bless your church. Going forth with this great news that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Help us to share this message and live it each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.